Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We welcome all our international guests from all over the world who have chosen to join us here on Peace TV today as we look at this important subject of how to call people to submission to the one true God, to Allah to Allah. And that Allah has no partners, that he has no sons, he has no daughters, he has no need for anything. He has no wants, he has no requirements. He's self-sufficient, he has no beginning, no end. He is not in a linear existence. He's not confined to anything that we as humans would try to force upon him or try to interpret that he would have to be confined into. So that means he is not confined into any space or time or shape or form like the Christians will believe that he came to earth as a human being or that he was a flame or a dove or things like that. So we're looking at characteristics that are required for a day over the last few weeks. And we've been saying in this series, last week especially, we're now looking at the don'ts. Things that a day should not participate or be doing. First and foremost, he should not be a person who is belittling or joking about or being involved in any sarcastic speech or talk against the Quran or against any of the authentic hadith. He shouldn't be running down these things and laughing and joking like many people we see in society do with their texts or their books. We do not do this as the day. He shouldn't degrade himself. In other words, he shouldn't be making himself look stupid on purpose for the sake of a little bit of press or a little bit of camera time. Um, we see when people are on marches, they're burning a flag, they'll be the ones screaming and shouting. Instead of just speaking coherently, explaining why you're on the march, explaining why we are here today, explaining concepts of what is going on. So the next point that this author raises in his writing, Dawa Ilallah, the title of the book that we are busy going through, as the framework on this course that we're going to be doing, inshallah. He says that a day should not be disheartened because of the bigger and more powerful numbers in opposition that he might come across. That he should not be disheartened because he may be living in a country where only 1% are Muslim or in an area which is majority Hindu or in a country that promotes atheism above religion. He should not be disheartened. There is a young man and a fantastic man that I'm very, very proud of. And I can't mention his name because yeah, I haven't asked him if I can say it. But he is from Russia. Youngster, young man. He's still in high school. He became a Muslim online through Facebook. And we had a conversation, eventually he took Shahada. He is the only Muslim in 600 kilometer radius where he lives. There are no other Muslims there. He's the only Muslim in a 600 kilometer radius. Imagine, he went to his high school and told them he needs to have time off twice of during the day to perform his salah. He has that courage. He's the only one. Can you imagine? Imagine if you were the only one in your village, the only person around that was a Muslim. And the only way you could get any teaching was through the internet, from somebody teaching you through the internet. Other than that, you never came across a Muslim. You never spoken to a Muslim on face to face. You have no idea about anything. Everything you're doing, you're doing solo by yourself. Yet this man is moving ahead. He's doing fantastic things in Islam, but he's all on his own, way away from anybody. Every time I speak to him or hear him, breaks my heart, absolutely breaks my heart. Here we have everything given to us on a silver plate in the Muslim community today. We, even if you're in a minority country like I am, where there's hardly any Muslims, or not, not much percentage-wise, we've got so much support. We've got dawah centers, we've got Qurans available, we've got books we can just get. Here's this young man, a school-going boy, probably graduated now, I think he matriculated, he's finished. But he was all alone for two years as a Muslim by himself. And he had to beg for every crumb that he could get to learn about Islam. And so no matter what opposition came his way, and he got it. Everyone thought he was a crazy. His school thought he was crazy. His community thought he was crazy. His parents thought he was crazy. Everybody thought he was, even the people on the internet thought he was crazy. And he stood up with a little bit of knowledge that he had. And he had to be taught in English, and it's not even his language, because I can't speak fluent Russian. I'm, you know, broken, broken 
phrases. So I had to teach him in English, which is not his language. So you look at the determination. There's a delegation from South Africa that goes to Russia, and they're helping the brothers because there's so many scholars in South Africa. And they're helping the Russian community because many of them don't know even how to read Surah Fatiha. They're having to struggle on their own, but they've got this hunger. The, the Muslim community is growing so fast in Russia, it's unbelievable. Absolutely amazing. So we must remember, and those people perhaps watching, maybe it's been translated for you, and you're watching in Russia, we are here for you. We are so proud of what's happening in the Russian community. So these people, no matter what opposition comes their way, they are just staying strong. And this is the requirement of a da'i, that you do not give in to opposition. Even though you might be outnumbered, even though you might be the only Muslim there, don't give in to the pressure. In South Africa, if I had have given in to the pressure, I wouldn't be, have said one word because I receive a lot of pressure. You've already heard on Peace TV before the things that I've been through. But these things make you stronger, better, more powerful as a da'i, that you don't give in. Otherwise, people would have given up a long time ago. You think of all the problems that those early Muslims went through. Think of all the problems that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu went through. Next point, a da'i should never be afraid of propaganda against him or her. In certain countries, and I prefer not to mention them, where I was banned from going into, they said I couldn't go in there. So we just put up a big screen TV and we have something called computers these days, in case those countries don't know. And we just go on live. So we're still in the country, even though we're not in the country. So we can still get in the country, even if we can't get in the country. So propaganda and nonsense and story won't stop the truth of Islam getting in. It won't stop a da'i coming into your country. We'll still get there. Maybe we just won't get there in the way you expect us to get there, but we will get there. Obviously, we shouldn't all be reckless. We must use wisdom. Because if they take all the people who are effective da'is or effective scholars off the map, then who's going to teach our people? And there is a systematic effort to destroy effective da'is and effective scholars. If you're crazy and you want to talk about jihad and killing them where you find them and destroy everybody, men, women and children, they will let you in that country. Do you know that? They let the crazies in because that's exactly what they want to put on their televisions. And they can say, look at these crazy Muslims. But if you make sense and you're scholarly and you're intelligent, and you're actually helping people come into Islam, that's the ones they don't want in the country because you are far more dangerous. So we must understand that you must never give up and never be afraid of the propaganda that comes your way as a dying. If it is an attack against what you stand for in Islam, so you never, never compromise your standards, never compromise your beliefs. So you must worship Allah and trust in Allah not that we are telling you to go and be stupid. Don't misunderstand. Remember everything we're talking about, we're talking about the middle road, the balance. So we're not saying go out and deliberately stir problems and then cry that you got stung. If there's a hornet's nest, you don't go poke it with a stick. And then when it's sting, you go, oh, look what happened. Why did it do this to me? Well, you provoked it. So then you can't cry when you get locked up or get in trouble. I'm talking about unprovoked. If we are simply wanting to go give the message of truth, to save humanity from itself, because sometimes that's what it needs, we're talking about that situation. So it's no use provoking anger, like some people in history have done, um, in Muslims supposedly doing da'wah or whatever, and then they land up provoking the problem, and then of course you're going to get bitten. We're talking about when it's unprovoked. What did many of those people who got banned on that same list at the same period of time what did they do? Nothing. Nothing they actually did that they got banned. They got banned simply because they were telling the truth. They were presenting simple Islam. They were asking people to submit to Allah because it's more dangerous there. Okay, the next point that he raises, a da'i should never compromise on his mission. And his mission is to call people to submission to Allah to Allah. We don't need to compromise. We don't need to lower our standards. We don't need to say, well, I'm so sorry that Muslims believe this, but I have to tell you this, no. If you're embarrassed about Islam, 
then you need to maybe go a little bit more and do some more studying. Maybe you need to sit a little bit longer in lectures and maybe you shouldn't have left so early from that talk where you only heard half of the reason. Because a lot of people say, well, you know, I like Islam, but this whole idea of polygamy, I mean, that's just too much for me. That's because you only stayed for half the talk. If you had stayed for the rest of the talk, it would have been put into its perspective for you. And you would have understood what the requirements are. Instead, you only picked up the one part of the discussion. The same thing when it comes to jihad. People only pick up the one, one perspective of it, and they don't listen to the whole lecture. So make sure that when you are talking as a da'i, that you don't compromise your mission when calling people to Allah, that you don't play down things, you don't change what the message actually is to suit whoever it is that you're wanting to call. It's very, very important that you represent Islam accurately. And maybe you represent Islam as accurate as you have knowledge, but you may make a mistake. Then there's nothing wrong with coming back next time you have the opportunity and apologizing for the mistake that you made. It's human to make a mistake. As long as we realize that and come back and make a public apology about it the next time we meet those people, or next time you're given an opportunity to do it. So this is very, very important that we do. The next point that he raises, a Dai should never compromise on his mission. And his mission is to call people to submission to Allah Ta'ala. We don't need to compromise. We don't need to lower our standards. We don't need to say, well, I'm so sorry that Muslims believe this. But I have to tell you this, no. If you're embarrassed about Islam, then you need to maybe go a little bit more and do some more studying. Maybe you need to sit a little bit longer in lectures and maybe you shouldn't have left so early from that talk where you only heard half of the reason. Because a lot of people say, well, you know, I like Islam, but this whole idea of polygamy, I mean, that's just too much for me. That's because you only stayed for half the talk. If you had stayed for the rest of the talk, it would have been put into its perspective for you and you would have understood what the requirements are. Instead, you only picked up the one part of the discussion. The same thing when it comes to jihad. People only pick up the one, one perspective of it, and they don't listen to the whole lecture. So make sure that when you are talking as a da'i, that you don't compromise your mission when calling people to Allah, that you don't play down things you don't change what the message actually is to suit whoever it is that you're wanting to call. It's very, very important that you represent Islam accurately. And maybe you represent Islam as accurate as you have knowledge, but you may make a mistake. Then there's nothing wrong with coming back next time you have the opportunity and apologizing for the mistake that you made. It's human to make a mistake. As long as we realize that and come back and make a public apology about it the next time, we meet those people, or next time you're given an opportunity to do it. So this is very, very important that we do. A da'i should always remember the fact that even the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and the other prophets all had enemies. They all had people who were gunning them down, looking for them, hunting them down, wanting them to, to compromise their mission. We know so many narrations of how the people who had come to the Prophet Muhammad and say to him, like, if you do this, we'll give you this. If you just say, don't keep preaching what you're preaching, we'll make you rich, we'll give you possessions, we'll give you fame, we'll give you fortune, we'll give you political power. And he would not compromise under no circumstance. Even if it was for his own safety, he wasn't prepared to compromise. In the same way, we must be very pleased that we have somebody who gave us a model to follow. Because he wasn't arrogant in the way he answered them. He had respect, he called them, he called them my uncle, my uncle. And he spoke to them with kindness. I wouldn't do that, it's not gonna happen. Even if you gave me the sun and the moon, nothing. Sometimes when we want to stand up for right, we say, we'll never, and we get all aggravated and we put a nice YouTube video on how our defiance is. That's not the way. We must do it with gentleness and kindness and compassion and understanding and tolerance. We want to leave the door of communication open. We want to leave the door of dawah open. We don't want to shut it so tightly closed 
that anybody who tries to come with any truth in the future will never be heard because of the damage you did. I had a teacher who was a wonderful teacher, fantastic teacher, but towards the end, he sort of lost his mission and he started doing those crazy videos that I'm talking about. The ones that he became very angry and upset and started shouting and, and becoming that crazy guy that you wouldn't expect. Why he went like that, nobody knows. No one can figure that out. So we must be very cautious that we become people that leave doors open for Islam without compromise, but we must make sure that we leave the door open for the next generation or the next group that comes through. So Adai should always stand firm in his belief and not compromise and never compromise or follow the desires of those who have already gone astray. Not follow the teachings of those people who have already gone astray, just so that he can fit in. So whatever he does, he must follow the traits and the characteristics of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and those early Muslims. Look at the heroes of Islam. We need to look at the heroes of Islam and try to emulate them more and see how we can implement their example into our own lives. Their behaviors, how do they deal with issues? How do they problem solve? You know, sometimes we only look at the role model of the prophets, but what about their disciples and those that came after them, their followers? How do they deal with issues? It's important that we have a look at all the heroes that, that are recorded in Islamic history as well. Those first and second, third generation of Muslims. So many beautiful stories. So many amazing stories that we can look at. You don't have to follow them religiously, but they give you examples of how to have, have situational relief, how to solve problems that they had in those days that we still have in these days. So it's very important that we get familiar with the heroes of Islam as well. So we need to stand firm on the traits that have been given to us through the pages of the Quran. And so in that way, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu will become more alive in our lives. His character will become more, more alive in our lives, not in the Christian understanding of that, but we'll want to emulate more in the way that we live our lives. The most important thing that we need to understand in this series is that when we are calling people to submission to Allah, that we are explaining to them that Tawheed is a requirement that they have to have before they are introduced to all these other things that we've been talking about. Talking about the heroes of Islam, talking about all these other things. These are important, but these are more for mature Muslims as you've matured a bit. Some people mature in a week, some people mature in five or 10 years. There's not one size fits all. With our classes in South Africa, where we teach revert classes, you can join any time. So there's not like a two-month course. You can join any time, anywhere, and you can just slot in. And then each person, even though you might come as a group, we have a talk, 15, 20-minute talk, and then they each break and they get their little set books, and they work from their book. And so we go to each one, and we help each one individually. Because they all are at different levels. Some people will go ahead so fast. Other people will take their time. There's two brothers that are in one of the classes. They're both indigenous brothers from the African community. I'm both university students. If you look at the IQ, are almost the same. Both very, very smart students. But there are huge differences between the understanding of the knowledge. One is Arabic is right up there already. The other one is very, very basic still. This one who's basic of Arabic is here. His understanding of Quran, Tawheed is much higher in this brother. So there are many different, they're not all, it's not one size fits all. So it has to be individually taught. So that's most important is that we need to understand that we've got to teach them to heed in the one-on-one -on -one teaching. Must get proper understanding. It means we need to get them relevant books on the subject. No use getting a heavy book. Like a lot of people get excited and there's a very good book on Tawheed that they want to give to a new revert. It's too heavy for him. Even born Muslims battle with that book. So rather give them something more very basic, just the, the different forms of Tawheed. That would be much more important to start someone with. So as he grows and as he develops, or she grows and she develops, then you can introduce them to some of the other more heavier explanations of Tawheed. But they must at least have a basic understanding of the concepts of Tawheed. Not a basic, more than a basic understanding of the concepts of Tawheed. Okay. So, 
we see that the other point that a DAE needs to have, according to this book, a DAE should never use derogatory or insulting language with other people, especially for those whom Allah holds dear or in high esteem. So we must be very cautious of insulting scholars. Sometimes we find that people will write a book, and in the book they will say, I hate this scholar, and this scholar is a shaitan. You've seen that. You've seen those type of statements written. That is terrible to do, because that scholar is quoting the Quran, he's quoting Hadith. Maybe his interpretation might not be the way you like it, but you must rather be specific. Rather say, I have a problem with Arib Islam because in this line he said this and his interpretation of this from the knowledge that I have and his messenger knows best is this, this, and this, and this. That's how we should be doing it. That's not how it's happening. What's happening is we're having sweeping statements being made and people are attack people. It's happened a lot again where people make these sweeping statements about him. They will say he's not a scholar. He never claimed to be a scholar. He's a scholar of comparative sciences. He's not a scholar as some people want to interpret the word scholar to mean. So we have to be cautious of the way we say things. Do not use words that are in a, of an insulting language, derogatory terms when talking about, especially so, scholars. But also when you're talking about the Jews and the Christians, because we have to be cautious that we don't attack them as people. So we are pointing the issues that we have with Judaism and Christianity as a religion. But I don't like talking about specific people. I might occasionally refer to an apologist, not a Christian scholar. So you'll never hear me talking about a Christian scholar or Jewish scholar and running them down. But I will specifically speak about a Christian or Jewish apologist because he is somebody who is claiming that he is extra information that can prove his case and therefore I have to use him as a quote that person's name when dealing with his work. Other than that, we sh shouldn't refer to them by name or attack a person. Just problems with the belief, not with the person. We must play the ball, not the player, like they say in soccer. Well, anyway, that's all the time we have for this week. So you're going to have to join us again, same place, same time. So from us here in the studio, Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh.